Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. And today I wanna to talk about the evolution of source control. Source control is widely used now, was not ever used in the 80s, at least know where I was. Source control is using software to maintain ownership of an asset that's going into the game. This asset, asset could be a code module, it could be a piece of art, it could be a script, but source control manages the versions of those and who owns it and what the latest one is. So let me tell you how we did source control in the 80s and even early 90s. A lot of the games I worked on either had one programmer, which was pretty much Bard's Tale and Rags to Riches, or on Grand Slam Bridge, even though there were multiple programmers, there was for any particular code module, there was only one programmer. So you basically owned the code. And whatever was on your machine was the latest version. Builds were made by putting that code onto a build machine. When there was when I, there was only one programmer, my machine was the build machine. I would get art from artists. I would get sound files. I would get scripts. Whatever was happening, I would get them, put them on my machine, and make a build from my machine. Um, for something like Grand Slam Bridge, I remember giving code to the lead programmer, and he would then build it on his machine. On Rags to Riches, I think was one of the first times we might have had a build machine. I don't remember, but that would be a machine that wasn't one that any particular one on the team used, but everybody went and put their assets on it, whether it was their art or their sound or the code, and it was built there. I know by the time we started Fallout in 1994, that was the first time we ever used software-controlled source management. And that was a, a piece of software called SourceSafe. It was from Microsoft. SourceSafe was great because it lived up on the network and you check things in to source safe or check things out. If you added a file, it would go into source safe and then become read only on your machine so you couldn't touch it. If you wanted to, you could get stuff out of source safe and it would get read only copies on your own machine. So if I wanted to make a build with the latest version of all the assets, I would just do a get I would get all the latest versions and I could do a build on my machine and have a version of the game with all the latest assets and code. If I wanted to make a change to code, I would have to check out that file from SourceSafe. And this is, everyone would have to do that. Artists would have to check out an art file, a texture, script scripter would have to check out a script, a audio person would have to check out a sound file. But SourceSafe was exclusive, meaning when you checked it out, it became writable on your machine and no one else could check it out. It was seen as checked out by you. And if anyone else went to SourceSafe to check it out, it would say, sorry. And it would say, Tim has it right now. So you could sometimes go to someone and go, hey, we need to do a, a build and you're sitting on a, you know, you have a bunch of files checked out. But the interesting thing about exclusive checkout meant you had to think about how you were doing code. Because if you had a module that was really big and controlled a lot of parts of the game, Multiple programmers might want to get at that, and then they would argue over who had it. So it, part of how you broke up your code wasn't just um, how you thought the code should naturally break up into modules, but also you wanted the modules to be smaller so that if one programmer grabbed some part of the game, other programmers programmers could still work on other parts. So like your interface, you just didn't want one big interface module. You'd break the interface up to here's the inventory, here's the option screen, here's the main HUD, um, here's the journal, and you'd break those all up into different code modules so that different people could work on those interfaces on the, at the same time. Because the checkouts in SourceSafe were exclusive, there was no concept of merging, meaning you got a version from SourceSafe, you 
modified it and then when you checked it in it became read only on your machine and your new one checked in as the latest you could have a history and you could roll back to a previous one but it was a continuous linear history of changes that individuals made to files and you could it would have the name of the person who made the changes so you could see who had made changes that's how we sometimes knew when bugs had been introduced because you're like hey it's not working you saw someone check something in you could delta the two files and say oh he, he changed these lines oh there's a bug right there in that line that was great when we started working on arcanum i can't remember whether we used perforce i think we did but we had a different problem on arcanum in that the world editor needed to let multiple people edit the map because our world map was the entire map of arcanum so there's no way we could let someone check out the world map because, yes, that would give you Tarant, the city, but no one else could work on anything that was an external map in the entire world. So what we did for that one, and I described it more in one of the Arcanum videos, was when the editor started editing a sector, it would try to lock that sector. And the way it locked it was it would create a file on our network, on a shared folder, with the sector number as the file name and the extension .loc for lock because file creation is atomic in Windows. So we were basically leveraging something there where if you attempted to create the file and it already existed, somebody must have it locked. You could see who created the file and that would tell you who did it. So we even had that functionality. We had a, a timestamp on it. So you could even say when they locked it, how long they'd had it checked out. Um, if the file didn't exist, then nobody had it checked out and it created the file for you, you know, with your name as the creator. And then you had that sector checked out. So World Ed you, on Arcanum used file creation on a network folder to create these sort of locks and unlocks. Because of that, that was more like editing world map sectors was more like doing stuff in source safe. It was an exclusive checkout and there was no um, way to merge changes. But we also didn't have a file history because once it checked back in, it just, that data went into the our database and the lock was removed. When we finally got to Temple, by Temple and Vampire, I know we were using Perforce. Perforce was, from my point of view, just like everything you wanted in source safe but didn't get. So SourceSafe finally had what was called non-exclusive checkout, which meant more than one programmer could grab a code module, um, more than one scripter could grab a script. In theory, you could let more than one artist grab an art file, but we found the subsequent merging was very hard for that. So we usually, for non-text files, we usually disabled uh, non-exclusive checkout. So it became exclusive checkout. But for non-exclusive checkout, the way it worked was two people could check it out at the same time. The first person to check it in, it just went in. When the second person would go to check it in, it would say, hey, the file I have in source safe is not the file you have checked out. Let's merge it. And it would show the differences. And on a good day, what you had worked on and what the other person had worked on were in different parts of the text. And you could simply say, merge them and check in. On a bad day, you'd find out you two were working in the same area. And then you would have to work on that and figure out, well, they were making the for loop bigger, but I was changing what the for loop did so we can combine those changes. Sometimes you find out someone was fixing something you were fixing and boom, you just wasted some time. Or the two of you did different fixes and you'd have to go talk to them and say, which one do you want to use? In general, that tended not to happen because, at least for the programmers, as the lead programmer, I would tend to assign different things. Well, Steve Moray was the lead programmer on Temple. I was the lead, well, I acted as the lead on Vampire. I would um, assign different things for people to do. And so they rarely overlapped in a module. And when they did, they were almost always working in different sections of the module. Perforce, though, lets you do some other really cool things that we did allow for code and non-code assets. One of them was called shelving. Shelving is when you do a bunch of work, but rather than you want to, rather than check it in and overwrite what's there, you shelve it. And what it does is it creates a special little area 
and it checks that stuff in. And so that way, shelving was a way of working on something over multiple days, but at the end of every day, you can still check it in. So if anything, like if your machine crashed, you wouldn't lose anything. But because it was checked into a shelf, it was not included in the, if, if people did get, it was your own private little shelf. And then when you finally wanted to put it into the main branch, it would check to see if you had to do any merging. If you didn't, it would just overwrite what was there. And if you did, it would make you do the merge. A very similar thing to that is called branching. And branching in Perforce is when you take all of the asset files and you create a completely separate branch. And then when you're checking in and out, you have to say which branch you're working in. And then you check in and out on that branch. Branching is really useful for doing something like you want to make a demo. So you branch the game and you get the demo working. You know, maybe there's, you know, a few extra NPCs, a tutorial that gets thrown in, or maybe it's on a level that's not going to be included in the game. And all that data is just kept on the branch. Branching is also useful for once the game ships and goes out the door. And let's say you start working on DLC. Brand, those could be branches. Let's say you make patches. Those could be branches. And the reason for that is you may one day want to go back to the original unpatched version um, for different reasons. Uh, you may have someone who wants to see what the game was when you shipped. Someone what may want to make a version of your game on a different um, target. For example, you may have a PC version of the game and now you want to make it for PlayStation. They may want to do that on the base branch because the fixes that were done, especially if there were optimizations, may not apply in any way to the PlayStation branch. But sometimes it would. I mean, if there are bug fixes, and that's the good thing. You can go through and look at the check-ins and go, things that fixed mechanics and all that, boom, you want that. Things that changed how stuff was rendered to the screen, you're probably not going to need that for the PlayStation version. So having those different branches worked really well and was something... I wish I could go back in time and have had that on all my games. Anyway, I believe Perforce is still what's used today. We were using it on everything in Obsidian and on the Outer Worlds. It's a really good piece of software. But we've come a long way from Source Safe or from Source Control being it's whatever's on my machine is the real piece of code or whatever asset you're looking for. So it's come a long way in 40-some years. And I think it's that's a perfect example of where things have improved immensely and where software really helps in the development process. Anyway, I hope you like the evolution of source control.